And now for some strategy tips for Thea the Awakening, given in no particular order. Though, really, what better place to start than the beginning, with the difficulty options screen. I went over what each of these do in the second video in the series, so if you need a refresher, head back over there to check it out. But now for a different question. How much do these options actually mean to you, and how can they be used to, say, increase your score? I'll up all the options to max, and then slide the screen over to make some room. You can now see the highest possible score bonus each of these provides. And I'm going to add two more columns to this screen. The first is how much any of these options will actually make the game more difficult for you on a 1 to 10 scale, and the second will be a factor of added difficulty versus added score on a 1 to 5 star rating. 1 star being a lot of difficulty for a marginal score boost, and 5 star being a marginal difficulty boost for a huge score. Obviously there is a fair amount of opinion to these metrics, so feel free to disagree, or agree or anything else in the comments. For world size, the size of the game world goes up quite a bit, which means two things. One, there is a much higher chance that the spawns of a resource you want are far more distant, and two, the farther you get from town, the harder the enemies can potentially get. I like the normal size, only because I think small is just a tad too small, but ginormous landmasses can make your traveling long and hard so this gets a 6 in the difficulty column. And for a mere 15% score bonus, its rating is only 1 star. For world progression, well you all saw, or at least I hope you saw, how far I got into the sample playthrough at Snail, and the random spawns were manageable even though I kinda dragged my feet. Had this difficulty been upped, there's a good chance I would have smacked my face into walls of trolls. A stellar start can overcome a quick progression, but it's still a headache, so I give it a difficulty boost rating of 7, and again, for only a 15% score boost, a rating of 1 star. Economy can be brutal, or possibly not. Normal and hard can be largely offset with just leveling and gear, but extreme will set you so far back on your gathering timings that you may just decide to find all your gear instead. It is more of an early game penalty than an overall one, so ramping this option up just means needing to find a highway to some reliable gathering and crafting. Difficult, but doable. Difficulty rating of 5. 30% is a decent score boost, so 3 stars overall. Careful if mixing this with a ramped up world progression though. Challenges difficulty. Easy fights largely stay easy, but medium fights get hard, and hard fights can get near impossible. Though unlike a lot of the previous options, this one can be offset with a high skill. As in player skill, although the skill of your party doesn't hurt. Difficulty boost rating of 7. 30% score boost though, so 2 stars. Enemy aggressiveness. So the funny thing with this is, this game option can be offset with certain god and building choices. And at the end of the day, if a pack of rats wants to run you down aggressively, you'll just stomp all over them aggressively too. This option isn't that much increased difficulty, so long as you don't put yourself in precarious situations. So difficulty rating of 3. Only a 20% score boost, so overall this will get 3 stars. Careful if mixing this with progression and difficulty options. Starting Villagers 30% is a decent boost, but I'm going to 1 star this, because this isn't just how many people you start with. Your starting count also determines how much of a penalty you suffer for attraction and child growing events. So not only do you start small, it's exponentially harder to get big, causing this option to penalize you for big and small parties in both early and late game, resulting in a difficulty boost of 9. Reshuffles 15% isn't a big boost at all, but I'm going to give this a 2 star rating, because as long as you are making well balanced parties, you should be able to handle any level appropriate challenge. Even if your fighters end up in the back line, they can support the sages up front, or confuse, counter offense, or whatever. Difficulty rating of 3. Unless you are trying to punch above your weight class, so careful mixing this one with the challenges difficulty option. Saves. 15%, 2 stars. 
and a difficulty rating of either 4 or 0. Because full disclosure, if you want to game the system, you can. Should you try something and the result goes bad, you can Alt F4 and go back to your last autosave. Combine this with the willingness to save and exit before every encounter, and you can still effectively save scum, with loading times being the only cost. Well, that and your moral compass pointing straight downward, but this is a strategy guide, not an ethics class. Realism, and time for some better star ratings. The penalties to realism tend to not be horrific. The inability to harvest beyond one stack per turn tends to only be a real penalty with lower tier materials, and even less of a penalty if you went with a high economy option above. And while there are definitely certain strategies that can get eliminated with the no duplicate buildings modifier, there are also a lot of strategies that just use one of different buildings anyway, with or without this option. Difficulty boost rating of 3, and a massive 40% score boost means this gets 5 stars. Group Limits A very feast or famine difficulty option. Until you make a party at least 12 people in size, this modifier has no effect on gameplay whatsoever. And even once you pass that number, as long as your party is, again, well balanced and well equipped, you probably won't see it actually harming your battle prowess until you get closer to 18 people. And in non-fight challenges, where damage to you doesn't matter, you get to use your entire party eventually anyway. The famine part of this comes towards the end, where endgame fights definitely want you to bring huge amounts of potential, but again, mostly just a problem for the fights, not the other skill challenges. So difficulty rating of 5, and overall 4 stars. But side note, the other choice of 16 party group size, the one I normally use, actually brings the bonus all the way down to 10%, so that would only really be a 2 star from me. And lastly, Bloodlust. Massive 50% bonus, and as I went over in the characters video, there are a lot of situations where this option being on actually increases the chance of survival for hurt party members. A difficulty rating of 1, and an overall 5 stars. And I'd rate those even higher, but I don't like overusing that, I give it an 11 out of 10 joke. Just be sure to bring a good medic with you to any fights with giants or dragons. Those are my takes on the most efficient way to raise your scores, but I want to do a couple other things to this video, so let me fade into some gameplay here. So you started a new game. I have two things to mention here, and I'll start with the smaller one first. Combine all your people, unequip everyone, and re-equip everyone. Starting gear is random, and therefore hardly optimized. Of course, I said this during the sample playthrough too, so let me add one extra piece of advice. This whole party stripping and equipping thing isn't something you should just do on turn one. As a benchmark, I'd say you should re-pool and redistribute your gear every 80 turns or so, make sure everyone you have is optimized. Or, if you don't like watching turn counters, you can think of it logistically. Reset everyone's gear every third time your wandering party makes a trip home. Now the other thing, I'll fade back to my sample game here. The biggest strategic advice I can give at any difficulty and any god choice is to follow this mantra, always be building. Your success in this game will be on the backs of what you can build, and what you can build is determined by what you can harvest. And both of those are based off of how many research points you have. You want to build, gather, and gain research points all as soon as the game begins. So step one is to use whatever materials you start with to make gathering and crafting tools. Spare no expense, whatever your most powerful starting materials are, put them into these economy options. As those are being furnished, your wandering party will be exploring the area near to your base, seeing what resources exist. The idea is to find a good source of medium tier resources that you can get to easily, and then figure out what you can make with those resources perpetually. And if you ever run short of the material, take the items you are mass producing, recycle the worst of them to recover their materials, and keep going. In my sample game, I had spider silk right within my town's starting range, gold one hex out, elven wood two hexes out, 
and Darkwood three hexes out. I technically also have Vine down here, but that's just a lesser version of Spider Silk. Though if I didn't have the Spider Silk, it would have been useful. So that's the game's best string and mid-tier wood and metal, with the string being the easiest to gather since it's in my town's starting range. With that in mind, I would then go check out the research tree and see what I can build with these. The combination of wood and metal could make just about every experience gaining item here. However, the easiest item I have access to is the silk, so I want to try and prioritize recipes using that. And as it happens, there are two recipes that can be made with silk and wood, bows and light armor. Bows are marginally useful items, marginal as in they are good to have but don't take build priority from other things, but light armors are extremely welcome to a party. Spider silk and mid-tier wood light armors would be a pretty decent and low weight upgrade to the armor of anyone but my strongest fighters, and be about the best armor a low strength character can get until a late game silk and gemstone piece. So had I been trying to min-max my gameplay in the resource layout I had in my sample playthrough videos, then instead of rushing an elven wood herbalist hut and doing a lot of exploring, I would have done a modicum of exploring and then had my main group sit on the elven wood and wicker, occasionally dropping it off at town so that my crafters could pound away at some very decent mid-tier armors and gathering tools, powering my way through the tech tree in the process. The only reason I didn't do that in this sample videos is because, as I said way back in the first video, this isn't a guide for munchkin power gaming. Me sitting on two resource nodes for the game's first 50 turns simply wouldn't have made for a good video, either in terms of demonstrating the game or entertainment value. Of course, feel free to disagree with me in the comments, wink wink, smiley, thumbs up, note to self mouse, stop reading the video editing notes out loud. Right then. I'll end this video here, as I think I've gone over enough game starting tips so that anyone starting a new game has a plan on how to proceed and because I don't want another hour-long video. Tune in next time for some beginner to intermediate tips on combat strategy.